Recently, I had a brother send me a video, a link to a video by Brother David Daniels um, <clears throat> on the uh, Nestle's text. And uh, Brother David Daniels, if you don't know, he's from Chick Publications. Uh, heard, too, that uh, Jack Chick, Brother Jack Chick, uh, has gone home to be with the Lord now. So uh, it's, it's always sad. It's kind of a bittersweet thing when you hear a great saint that has died and gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, it's sad to see him go, but yet, you know, they're absent from the body, present with the Lord. So... Uh, Brother Jack Chick has influenced a lot of people, myself included. Um, great man. But uh, David Daniels, out there at Chick Publications, uh, he brought up a very interesting thing. And I had to look it up myself to confirm what he was saying. I thought, well, he's showing it. I think he's probably right, and of course he was. But um, <clears throat> changes in the Nestle's text. Very interesting. The Nestle's text, right here, I have the 28th in this hand, the 27th in this one. Um, the Nestle's text, if you're new to the whole Bible version issue, essentially, way back, you way back to when the Bible was being written, Paul spoke at one point about we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Um, you know, he's talking about the, the Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, chapter two, about being troubled by by letter as from us. People were counting counterfeiting scriptures as they were being written, literally. So um, you look at the. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, Antioch is where they were first called Christians. And yet Alexandria, Egypt, um, they're being persecuted. There were scholars from Alexandria, you know, people from Alexandria, Egypt there that were there to stone Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So um, Alexandria is not a good place. Uh, Christians were never organizing there and doing great works there. They were from Antioch in Syria. Um, what's the importance of that? Well, the Syrian text, this one right here, the Textus Receptus. This one here is based on over 99% of all extant Greek manuscripts. In other words, if you find a manuscript someplace, it's going to agree here. Okay? This has been used by the Greek Orthodox system. And Bible believers have primarily used this text. And I say primarily because translation is not an exact science of you can take it from this language directly into that language. There are words that have to be changed, added, whatever else. And you can still have a translation made that's just as good as the Greek or Hebrew. All right? um, there's translations all throughout the Bible in the original autographs. So don't tell me oh, no translation can be inspired. Not true. That's one of the lies of the Alexandrian perverts, the perverted scholarship that comes out of there. This is the received text. Textus receptus means in Latin received text. If you're an Orthodox type of Christian, a, and I don't mean Greek Orthodox necessarily, I'm saying a good, you know, somebody that would believe the Bible, and whatever, this is the text that's always been used by Christians. This one here, this text here, the Nestle's type text, is based on the minority of Greek, extant Greek manuscripts. In other words, um, when you have certain readings that are different and things, between King James Bible and the New Versions, the New Versions are getting their readings from here. This is the Roman Catholic Church's text that they have used, the Alexandrian type text. It goes way back to a school of philosophy in Egypt, all right, where they were writing and rewriting the Bible and changing things. They didn't like the deity of Jesus, so, you know, Jesus being God, so they'd take out in 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, and they'd say, He who appeared in the body or something. They were making changes to the text, to the scriptures, and they were taking verses out. And then they come along, and these people that stand by this will claim that the Textus Receptus people added verses. You know, when you hear about the NIV taking verses out, they'll say, well, we didn't take them out. We, we just had the original text as it is. You know, it's kind of funny because their big argument is they say, well, we have the oldest and best. Well, first of all, that's not true. There have been many manuscripts over on this side that have been found in recent years that have debunked their original claims of older and better manuscripts. And you study what the older and better manuscripts are, the two big ones, codices B and Aleph, and I know this is detailed stuff. If you've never heard of this, you're probably going, what on earth are you saying? Are you still speaking English? You know, their two biggest ones that they'll talk about, the two oldest and best manuscripts, um, there's pretty good proof that they're forgeries. That they're not from the fourth century. They're actually forgeries. And David Daniels has some really good stuff on that. I suggest watching his videos uh, to show you that, uh, in particular, the Sinaiticus or Sinaiticus, however you want to say it, 
um, was a forgery, the one that Constantine von Tischendorf found in the garbage at St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula. Um, pretty good proof that it was just a forgery, that a man wrote it back then in the 1800s, that it's not does not date back to the, uh, what, 4th century. So, but here's the interesting thing about this. There are thousands upon thousands of Greek manuscripts that they find, and, and sometimes it's just a little piece of a paper. Um, when you watch David Daniels' video, I'm going to put the link in the description box. When you watch it, you'll see his proof of this. I mean, it's literally just like a little part of the upper part of the page of this manuscript. And they're adding words in there. They're assuming they, they make a whole lot of assumptions. Well, it looks the writing style looks similar to this over here, so we can date the antiquity based upon the writing style. And then you find out that paleography, I think it's what it's called, that, that science, was actually created by the Jesuits, as well as some other Roman Catholics. So Jesuits will create uh, science, so to speak, to prove certain things that the Catholic Church teaches to be true. They rewrite history to prove history. And I'm not lying. It's amazing. But what's been going on now is you have... This over here, this, even though the Catholic Church has tried to destroy this text, this text here has been preserved by Christians. The, you know, the, Catholic, the Catholic Church has tried to burn these things and whatever else, and it's just incredible. And yet it still has been preserved. So, um, really, really something. But this text over here, there are over... I forget what the actual number is right now. I know it was like 5,200 and something Greek manuscripts that line up with the Texas Receptus and 45 that line up here. Now do your math. Uh, that's less than 1% of the Greek manuscripts in the world will line up over here. 99 plus percent over here with the Texas Receptus. So this, by many people, has been called not only the Texas Receptus, but the majority of Greek text. Okay, this is a big issue. I could go off on this for a long, long time. But what's been happening is here, uh, this one here, what you have is, I can't zoom in right now. I think my remote, the battery's dead. Uh, yep, dead. But uh, what you have here is you have the, the text up here in Greek, and then down here is what they call the critical apparatus. In other words, this manuscript has it, this manuscript doesn't, this one has it. They put where they get the support for this writing up here, the scripture up here, in which manuscripts it's coming from. Now, David Daniels shows this in great detail. Like I said, I can't show it too, too well right now. But if you look at down here in the critical apparatus, you will see an M. It's kind of like a stylized M, meaning majority text. All right. But... And, you know, I've showed this thing in different studies, too, by the way. The 27th edition, in the very beginning, it says that it's made under the supervision of the Vatican. A Jesuit cardinal, Carlo Maria Martini, sat on the board of editors. All right. And the others, you know, Kertelon and, and, you know, these other people, they're all liberals as well. Not even saved. So that one says majority text, the 27th edition. The newest 28th edition comes out, and they've taken out... In certain places, they've taken out majority, and now they have BYZ, Byzantine. So now what they're doing is, again, they're rewriting history. And they're coming along and they're saying, it's no longer the majority text, it's just a Byzantine text. And you'll hear them say these lies, like they'll say, it's a, it's, it's a partial truth, I'll say it that way. They'll say, uh, um, Erasmus only had a few late manuscripts leading the person to believe that there's not really that much Greek support, Greek text support for the King James Bible. Because Erasmus wrote, he started the, you know, Greek text, basically, that eventually became the Textus Receptus, which is, you know, he compiled it, you know, from better manuscripts and things. Not this one, excuse me, this one. But, um, and what they'll do is they'll say, Erasmus only had a few late Greek manuscripts. And thereby leaving the hearer to think, well, oh, wow, the King James is only based on a few late manuscripts, not early manuscripts like the uh, Catholic Nestles here. Um, and well, what they don't tell you is Erasmus used 
late manuscripts, and he only used a few of them. Why? Well, because you pick the ones that are in the best shape. You don't pick the most ancient Greek manuscripts that you can find, and you would pick ones that are newer because you don't want to defile the really, really old ones. You know, it'd be like me saying, <clears throat> you know, I have, a, I have a King James Bible down here in this, my one, uh, actually put it in a, a little tote now, you know, I'm trying to keep them safe, but it's from 1814. Now, I should be preaching from that instead of my uh, 2000, and probably this is about a, maybe 2002, when I bought this King James Bible, this Cambridge, you know. Uh, Brian Denninger only prepares his sermons from a newer edition of the King James. Uh, what does that prove? It proves I'm going to preserve my old one that I have, my old, you know, really, really old, you know, 200-year-old, you know, Bibles. I'm not going to use those to prepare sermons. I'm going to use my new one, all right? That's what Erasmus did. Erasmus didn't need to go back and find the oldest and best manuscript, you know, and the, the very oldest and ancient, just barely touch it and it's fallen apart and things, you know. Use the newer ones that line up with the old ones, see? But see, they don't tell people that. And what they're doing now is they're saying, what, with this Byzantine thing, they are purposefully changing the argument to now it's no longer majority. It's just Byzantine. Very, very clever what these Jesuits are doing. And, it, and it's the Jesuits that are involved. Again, I'm not, you know, people, you think the Jesuits are behind everything? Well, <laughs> you know, when I see a guy there involved in it, like uh, Carlo Maria Martini and S.J. behind his name, that means Society of Jesus. That means he's a Jesuit. So um, you say you're conspiratorial. Uh, yes, the Catholic Church makes me that way. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Jesuits come out, their intended purpose, way back in the 16th century when they were founded, um, their intended purpose is the Counter-Reformation, to bring all people back to Roman Catholicism. What better way to bring them back to Roman Catholicism than to take away the received text, the one that has power, and give them the false minority Greek text from Egypt that God will not bless. God has never used the Egyptian Bible. God uses the Syrian. There are two different Bibles. Again, you know, that's something a lot of people don't realize. They don't understand they think, well, the King James Bible is kind of Old English, Elizabethan English, and the NIV, the ESV, or whatever else, they're, they're based on newer scholarship and moder more modern English. That's not the truth at all. That is a lie. The new versions are based upon Roman Catholic Greek texts. And people say, oh, Erasmus was a Roman Catholic, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> then uh, the Catholic Church surely would have used their greatest scholars' uh, Greek text, wouldn't they? To all you uh, new version supporters, name one Bible version that the Catholic Church used the Textus Receptus on. Name me one. And it's funny too because, oh, you know, these new versions, they have better, more modern readings and better scholarship and everything. Funny too because in 1582, the Jesuits created their own English translation called the Reims New Testament. 1610 came out the Old Testament, the Dewey. Uh, in 1610, so it was the Dewey Reams, came out one year before the King James Bible, and yet that Dewey Reams translation has a lot of the uh, more modern readings, you know, in it before the King James Bible came out. You understand what I'm saying? The King James Bible comes out a year after this Dewey Reams. The Dewey Reams has a lot of the new, new readings that the NIV has in it, or the New American Standard or whatever else. It's not new Bibles. They're Catholic Bibles. They're Vatican versions. Please understand that. If you're using one of these new versions, um, God's not going to bless it. They're false Bibles. They're satanic, corrupt perversions. All right. But uh, watch David Daniels' video. He's going to get into a lot more of the details and things like that. I would suggest subscribing to his channel if you really want to know more about the Bible version issue. Uh, he's got some really good stuff. And uh, he's definitely more of this scholar than I am on this whole issue. Um, you know, my, my mission and calling has been to defend the Word of God and preach the Word of God. Uh, I'm not so much the scholar as I am a preacher. That's what I want to do. I, will, I understand the Bible version issue well enough that I can defend it, but uh, to me, 
I'm going to spend my time, now that I know that I have a perfect book in my language, the greatest book that's ever been written, uh, I'm going to spend my time preaching it. So uh, please check out his video. It's a very interesting thing to see how the Jesuits, again, working through the Nestle's text, are changing and rewriting history. So now new Bible students that go off to the seminaries are going to look and they're going to see it's no longer majority text. It's now Byzantine. You know, all oh, what just you know what Erasmus used, and then they they combined Byzantine with Erasmus only had a few late manuscripts to leave the young impressionable student to think to themselves. Well, I guess the King James Bible is really not best based on the best uh, available evidence out there. Uh, yes, it is. The King James Bible is based on true Bible scholarship. All right, the new versions are based on very, very weak, poor arguments. Extremely weak, poor arguments. But, you know, what's the official stand of the Roman Catholic Church on the Scriptures? The Scriptures are subservient to divine tradi tradition. They are not believers in the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura. They don't believe in it. So, uh, why waste a whole lot of time, you know, having the Bible preserved and whatever else? Change it when you need to. That's Catholicism. And that's what the uh, philosophy behind the New Versions is. So that's going to be it for this video. Check out David Daniels' video in the description below if you want to learn more.